Uh, welcome to all of you. My name is Brian Finley. I'm the president here at, uh, at the Stimson Center. It is uh, a privilege to welcome you all to what is a very special event for us uh, this morning. And uh, particularly, uh, 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 it's a particular honor to have with us uh, today Admiral Michelle Howard, uh, a distinguished um, uh, a retired member of, uh, uh, of the U.S. Uh, Navy and most importantly, a member of our board here at uh, the Stimson Center. Admiral, thank you for being here. Vice Admiral Daniel Abel is also joining us from the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you, sir, for, for being here. And, uh, and soon to join us uh, online will be uh, Tony Long, who is the CEO of, of Global Fishing Watch as well. For some of you, I suspect this is your first time here at, uh, at Stimson, so a particularly warm welcome uh, to those of you uh, first-timers here at Stimson. For the past 30 years, Stimson has, uh, I believe, um, uh, developed a, a strong pedigree on international security issues. Um, we're most interested in tackling those issues that really collide, that, that operate at the intersection of complex global problems. And so for those uh, of you experts in the audience, it is no surprise that uh, IUU fishing and, and the scourge of of distant water fleets is uh, is a high priority for us here at Stimson. You know better than I do that it is not just an economic issue, it is also a development issue, it is a conservation issue, and for us as well, it is uh, the knock-on impacts um, that, uh, that they engender make it uh, every bit uh, a, an international security issue as well. And so we're gonna talk about all of those uh, various issues uh, here this morning. We're very proud to release uh, a report that you hopefully would have in your hand, and if you don't, they are available uh, at the back of the room uh, that is looking at, uh, in, in I think a very nuanced and interesting way, again, the intersection of all of those, uh, all of those various uh, global trends. Um, it is, for us, the beginning of a process, not the end. Stimson is a little bit of an oddball think tank in that we don't just like to think big things and write big papers. We actually like to get our hands dirty out in the field and, and do things. So we really look forward in the coming months and years to working with all of you in this room to, to not just uh, study the problem, but to operationalize some of the findings and, and recommendations that, uh, uh, that we have uh, unearthed. I think what makes uh, this organization so special is the quality of people that we have, and we are very honored to have as the director of our environmental security work, Sally Yozel. Sally, uh, as many of you, I suspect, know in the audience, uh, uh, brings to Stimson a long and distinguished career uh, in government, in private industry, in the nonprofit sector, uh, but more importantly, she brings, uh, I think, a deep, deep passion for, um, for our environment on land uh, and uh, and on the seas. Uh, I really uh, commend you, Sally, for, and your team for the remarkable work that you have put, in, uh, put into this. Of course, none of this happens without uh, the support of our funders, and so I want to thank uh, Chuck uh, Fox and, and, and Oceans 5 for your uh, leadership and foresight uh, in, in pushing us to, to, to consider this issue. Thanks, Chuck, for that and for being here as well. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Sally Gozell. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Wow. Okay. Let me get my act together here with the. Work. Okay. Can everyone hear me all right? Great. Um, so, good morning, and thank you all for coming on. I knock it off, a Friday morning. Um, and also, thank you, we have a lot of people on the webinar, so thank you to those who came in person, and thank you to everyone who is joining us by the webinar this morning. I am absolutely thrilled to have folks here and for us to be launching our new report, um, which, again, as uh, Brian said, is available um, out back for everybody. And, and um, And we really do have, sorry, I'm just pulling myself together. Um, we really do have a fantastic um, lineup today, as you can see from um, our panelists. And as I look around the room, I mean, I see folks from, gosh, NOAA, State, USAID, the Navy, Coast Guard, uh, NGO community. Um, I'm, yeah, so how impressive is that? So let's just get right to it. Do I need this? I don't need this. 
Okay. Um, so, so as everyone knows, commercial fishing is big business. Um, you know, it employs over 56 million people uh, worldwide. 1.3 million people rely on seafood for their protein. Um, it's the primary source. And the problem is that, as all of you guys know, 90% of uh, fisheries and seafood is either overfished or fished to capacity. Um, and furthermore, in this big industry that is so important to commerce and uh, food security and economic security around the world, corruption, there are allegations of corruption, of labor abuses. Um, in our research uh, over the last several years, we've seen evidence of trafficking of illicit and black market goods, guns, drugs, and even humans. And so, despite its importance, what we found is there is such a lack of transparency all across the seafood supply chain. And that's what we really need to get a handle on. Um, the lack of transparency is impeding the effective resource management and enforcement and really increasing the risk uh, that distant water fleets will engage in IUU fishing. IUU fishing, for those I'm sure everyone knows, is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, but we'll just call it IUU today. Um, so the environmental security team here at Stimson um, you know, has been conducting research on this global distant water fleet, and, and I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of that shortly. But um, what I wanted to highlight a couple things before I go into that is to interestingly um, focus on some of the things that we found, you know, what and you know, who are these vessels? And I think one of the key finding pieces we found was that these, the majority of the distant water fishing fleet are actually sanctioned flagged vessels, sanctioned flag state vessels. They're, and they fish in areas where no one is really focusing on their operations. And with that, they can engage in labor abuses and underreport their catch. And though you know, when you think about it, don't forget, underreporting may not be an illicit activity, but it is still part of the IUU dimension. And so by engaging in IUU fishing, whether you're a sanctioned flag vessel or not, you are actually robbing coastal communities of their resources, which undermines their economic security, their environmental security, and their food security over the long term. Um, so what I'd like to do today, I'm going to briefly introduce our panel. I'm going to talk about our report. We'll hear from them, have a bit of a conversation, and open it up for all of you to engage in the conversation. Um, so I'm really pleased to have such two such impressive uh, panelists uh, with us today. Um, Vice Admiral ha Dan Abel is the Coast Guard Deputy Commandant for Operations. Um, and what does that job do? He is in charge of developing operational strategy and policy guidance and prioritizing the resources that the Commandant, I mean, that the Coast Guard spends. Previously, Admiral Abel led the military in the Caribbean and Central and South America, known as SOUTHCOM, and he's also been responsible for operations in the North Pacific, the Arctic Ocean, and the Bering Sea. And of course, in my hometown of Boston, I'm always appreciative to find someone who had the, was lucky enough to work in the north end of Boston. Um, and so we are so lucky to have Admiral Abel with us today, who has really shown an interest in combating IUU fishing. Our second speaker is retired U.S. Navy Admiral Michelle Howard. And wow, Admiral Howard was the first four-star, woman four-star in the Navy. And she recently commanded the naval forces in Africa and Europe where one of her roles was to coordinate capacity building in the Gulf of Guinea. In, mo in almost all of her four decades of naval service, she led on maritime security issues, from maritime security in the Arabian Gulf to commanding the multinational counter-piracy efforts. And so I think we'll hear some really interesting stories from her about the importance of maritime domain awareness and the link to fishing vessels and security, both in coastal nations, particularly in Africa. And then we have Tony Long, who is joining us from the UK this morning. And um, Tony is uh, the CEO of Global Fishing Watch, where he is really at the forefront of using technology to enhance surveillance of fishing and transshipment vessels and support fisheries enforcement, while building greater transparency across the whole fishing industry. 
Uh, earlier in his career, Tony was a commander in the Royal British Navy, where he spent 27 years and served on the first Sea Lords strategy team. So with that, I'm going to do a little walkthrough of our report, and um, so let me begin. Um, okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so let me begin. Our new report, Shining a Light, the Need for Transparency Across distant water fishing. You know, despite its growing importance to the seafood supply chain, as you who have been working on these issues know, the, the, the seafood industry is really shrouded in mystery. It's this opaque system that limits information about where vessels operate, who owns them, the amount of fish that is being caught, how fish is being shipped, human labor practices on board, and access arrangements in the nations where they fish. We don't see this kind of secrecy in many industries. So to begin with, countries choose to invest in their distant water fleets for a variety of reasons. Often many countries have actually depleted their own fishery resources. Um, and so as a result, they, for economic reasons and food security reasons, they've opted to um, go outside of their economic zone. Also, there's been this incredibly big improvements in fishing vessel technology. Massive. I mean, when we, I was, when we did our research and field work, the size of some of these vessels, massive vessels that are able to travel further, stay at sea longer, and catch more fish than ever before. So what did our research set out to do? Um, <clears throat> we sought to find out who are the top 10 distant water fishing, fishing fleets, excuse me, where are they fishing, what are the motivations of where they operate, and what are the implications of where they operate, particularly on the coastal nations where they go? So we conducted multiple interviews and with experts across the globe, and we worked with Global Fishing Watch, um, Tony's group, and we used automated information systems to really track and identify the top 10 fleets um, that were fishing in other countries' economic, exclusive economic zones known as EEZs. So AIS, is a vessel tracking system, um, but it has its limitations. Vessels can shut off the AIS, and I know Tony's going to talk a little bit more about that. So, who are they? Well, I didn't have to do much research to figure out who are the top five uh, or five, top ten distant water fleets, but when we delved into our research, what I was really surprised at was that the top five fleets actually are, cover 90% of global distant water fleet operations. So with that, we decided to really concentrate on those five fleets. And who are they? As you can see here, China is number one, Taiwan is number two, Japan three, South Korea, and Spain. And again, it represents 90% of the distant water fleet operations. And even more interesting is China and ta Taiwan, when you combine the two, actually represent 60% of all the fleet operations um, globally. So where are they going? I know this is kind of hard to see, but um, you know what we found was that the, the, the fleets were going to really three main regions, the Pacific, East Africa, and West Africa. They also go to South America, but the first three are where they seem to be the most. Um, and while the fleets use a variety of vessels and gear, fishing gear, about two-thirds of the vessels target high-valued tuna. And so they end up being what's called purse saners and longliners. And longliners, which are the majority, um, are really the most difficult to track. They often use carrier vessels to resupply their fu fu fuel and food and transship their catch. And as a result, they barely go to port. We found that the distant water fleets often fish in coastal countries waters, but they do not land their catch there, nor do they invest in those local economies. Not only does this take fish resources out of these countries' res uh, uh, areas, but it deprives the same communities of fishing-related jobs like fish processing, servicing of vessels, and the training necessary for them to sustain their own fishery resources over time. And Chinese fleets, however, this was interesting on the other hand, they seem to transship less than the other fleets um, when you compare them. The Chinese government and Chinese businesses are actually building port infrastructure in many of the coastal nations where they fish. And 
one, it helps them get their fish to market, but secondly, it helps them build a physical infrastructure that kind of parallels their Belt and Road Initiative, giving them an ability to expand their economics as well as their geopolitical influence. Oops, okay. So what were some of the motivations we found of the fleets? Um, economics was the most, uh, was the number one motivation. Um, as one of our interviewees, interviewees put it, um, fishing fleets are driven by where the fish are, not a big surprise there, and how easily and cheaply they can get their fish to market. Second, we found that the fleets are more likely to fish where governance and enforcement is low. Um, weakened governments have a reduced capacity to monitor activities, making it easier for distant water fleets to underreport their catch, as I highlighted earlier, and to engage in IUU fishing. And thirdly, and finally, distant water fleets is often tied to political influence and sometimes corruption. Um, we found that in some cases, fish access agreements, fish access um, is granted to those distant water fleets in exchange for short-term revenue and infrastructure projects. For example, during our field research in Mozambique, we learned that, you know, Mozambique has pretty good fishery management laws. But experts we met with highlighted these quid pro quo deals, something we keep hearing around here, um, oops, um, uh, between China and the government. Um, and in fact, several fisheries officials actually really expressed outright frustration that when they tried to enforce against Chinese vessels, um, they were told by the powers upstairs, just look the other way. And in the case of Ghana, for example, strong fisheries lo laws also exist, and they prevent, in fact, foreign flagged fishing vessels from fishing within their waters. However, they've created this loophole, which is many countries have, which is called joint venture agreements, which essentially allows shell fishing companies to exist where vessels are actually owned, captained, and crewed by another country, and it's often China. These type of arrangements are proliferating and really reinforcing the need that we have to have greater transparency about ownership. So some of the policy recommendations. It, it, it was clear from our research that transparency is number one, and transparency is so much across uh, the whole seafood supply chain, um, whether it is improving the accountability of flag states or building capacities in coastal nations. I mean, let's be real. In today's modern society, transparency, transparency should really be a social li license for global fishing operations. In our report, we provided 10 specific recommendations, which you'll find at the beginning, and I'm not going to go into all of them, obviously, because we don't have the time, but I just wanted to note that um, a few of the, the recommendations, I think one of the major ones is that we really have to make transparency a precondition of the global marketplace. We need to mandate AIS and VMS on fishing and transshipment vessels at all times. We need to require seafood traceability across the supply chain. We need to make information about access agreements and vessel ownership publicly available. And we can start to do that right now in our own market here in the United States and in some of the other markets that are moving forward, like the EU and, the, and, and Japan, for example. Um, we also recommended that coastal nations invest their revenues from access agreements back into enforcement and fisheries management. We want to level the playing field, and we suggest that flag states should really end subsidies, which support unsustainable practices. And I know that we announced some of that last week for the, by the U.S. and other nations at our Ocean Conference last week. In addition, both flag states and coastal nations really have to accede to the Port State Measures Agreement. Accede to it and implement it so that we can really try to deter illegal fish entering ports. And finally, given its importance to the global fishing you know, industry and our findings, I wanted to just make a note about China. China does warrant special attention. And you know, recent global movements indicate that China is willing to take perhaps a more assertive role in their fishing activities. They recently signed the Cape Town Agreement last week, which seeks to improve vessel safety, and they've stated that their intention to deny access to blacklisted vessels known to engage in IU fishing, excuse me, 
known to engage in IMU fishing entering their own ports. So China is currently promoting this Green Belt and Road Initiative. It's primarily been focusing on energy and climate. But, you know, we also recommend that they need to include ocean protection and sustainable fisheries as an additional focus area. So I just put an awful lot on the table. Um, and what I'm going to do now is turn it over to our panel. And I would like to invite um, Admiral Abel to please come up and, uh, and, 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 work, and do your thing. Oops. Should have a slide up there somewhere. Hey, good morning, everybody. Oh, here. Let me give you. Yep. All righty. There we go. So I could not have asked for better weather to get you thinking blustery, the wind's blowing, you're on the deck of a ship, and this is what you see. So, you know, no better friend, no worse enemy, the United States Coast Guard. So I'm going to talk about the enforcement side of the house. Now, can we catch everybody that's uh, fishing illegally? No. But can the trooper get everybody the speed? No. But as long as the trooper's out there, people think about the fact, am I going to be the one that gets caught? So that's called deterrence. And that really is the goal for the Coast Guard. So as a helo pilot, what I do is I tell stories. And hopefully the story will weave together some of the concept that Sally's talked about, some of the things we can do as a nation, things we can weave together uh, with other countries and non-governmental organizations to get around this vexing problem that, uh, that Sally set the stage for. And also we could talk about what the Coast Guard's role is as well as what some of the opportunities and the challenges may be. So I mentioned the Coast Guard Cutter Mellon. She's out there. God bless her. She, uh, she was born in the 60s. Uh, she's a little on the old side. I was born in the 60s and I know I'm ready for replacement. She is too. So keep sending your, uh, your dollars and cents to the Coast Guard. She spent 81 days doing North Pacific Guard. Uh, that's an operation that we do every single summer. And uh, what that operation does is it weaves together U.S., Canada, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and China with unity of effort about illegal fishing. Let me bring together that party pack again that typically do not work together. U.S., Canada, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and China. And it could be something as simple as Japan letting Canada base her P3s out of Japan so they're closer to where the business is. Those types of operations of working together. And for the 81 days that Mellon was out there, uh, she got results. 45 boardings with 69 violations of either the North Pacific or the Central Pacific Fishery Commission areas. And the ship you see here, the Young Da 5 102, and I'll just stick with the 102 for now, um, she was out there, Panamanian flag, Chinese owned transshipment vessel. Let me slow that down a little bit, and you already get into some of the complexities we're talking about. Panamanian flagged, okay, she's a Panamanian vessel, owned by the Chinese, and she's doing transshipment. She doesn't catch the fish. She helps those catching the fish, and she gets the fish to market. So I think you can see the complexities of flag states, vessel ownership, and the fact that the ship, or the fish, are going to change what ship they're on once or twice. So Mellon had a chance to put a boarding team on and found fish, uh, 16, uh, or the good news is we could put a boarding team on there. Of the 16 regional fishery management organizations that the Coast Guard participates in, three of them allow the U.S. Coast Guard or another vessel to come alongside and put people on board. The other 13 do not allow boardings under their provisions. They're con uh, conservation-minded, management, that all makes sense. But if you cannot board on behalf of a nation and do a safety inspection and take a look at how they're catching the fish and how they're accounting for the fish, there's a little or no opportunity to make sure it's transparent and it's legal. So um, this particular one was found to be doing illegal transshipment. Now, in the, the drug war that we do, this is easy at this point. Once you find illegal activity, you put the cuffs on them, you take them back to the Coast Guard counter, you put the cocaine on the deck, and there's a great offload somewhere in the United States, and you make the news. It gets a little more complex as far as the legal consequence here. We call the flag state. So we called Panama and said one of your ships, owned by the Chinese, 
is engaged in a legal activity. It is totally up to the flag state at that point for any sort of consequence. So we're relying on a third party to do something about that. In this particular case, Panama did the right thing. They recalled this ship to her home port, and then they deflagged, no longer Panamanian flag, this vessel, as well as one of her sister ships that they found doing the same thing. I wish I could tell you every flag state, with every time they're notified by the U.S. Coast Guard, on cases where we can get on board, takes that aggressive stance. But they don't. So the question is, besides doing this, what can the Coast Guard role be? Well, the first one would be in awareness. There needs to be a catalyst for the world to realize we have to team together to do something about this. So I'll give you a strong Bravo Zulu, and you're going to go, what the heck's a Bravo Zulu? If the Bravo flag and the Zulu flag are raised on the bridge wing, that means well done. Sally, you and the Simpson Center get a Bravo Zulu for getting this report out, which gets folks to realize we have got to do something as a world, as a community, about this particular thing. The next one is on governance. Many people say that the secret sauce for the Coast Guard maybe is not doing this, but perhaps it's the fact that we can get disparate parties to come together, unity of effort, and talk about what can we do collectively to get about this problem. So we look forward to knowing that. Next slide. I'm hoping somebody's got it. So you never go wrong quoting your host. So the distant water fishing fleet vessels more likely engage in IUU and are attracted to countries lacking robust fisheries management regime. This is uh, the Willie Sutton quote of, you know, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why do they go where they go? There's fish, and there's a lot, a lot of management, and there certainly isn't a lot of enforcement. So that's what we need to get about. Um, we can help these countries. These are nations that, number one, are heavily dependent on the protein in the waters around them. If that goes away, that's an existential threat to that particular nation. So number one, they need capacity, they need capability, and they need rule of law. Some mechanisms, when they do find somebody that's fishing illegally, to do something about it. Uh, in addition to the melon, we had Coast Guard Cutter Stratton. She's one of our newest cutters. Uh, she was doing boardings as well out there. And then we did something different this year. We took one of our buoy tenders, which typically is not big into fisheries enforcement, teamed her with one of our fast response cutters, a fairly new 154 uh, foot. We call them a strategic action group. I know the Admiral's probably thinking a buoy tender and a patrol boat's not a SAG, but it's a SAG for the Coast Guard. And we went island to island, and it was a good model for these countries because it's not a huge gray ship. It's not a frigate or a battleship. It's a small little presence that actively placed in the right areas can just make sure their sovereignty is protected. We also do the same thing off the coast of Africa. You mentioned the, the fisheries off the west coast of Africa. It's called AMLEP, Alaska, or, um, um, Africa Maritime Law Enforcement Program, AMLEP. We take ship riders from the nation's waters in which we're steaming. We put coasties, U.S. coasties, on their ships, and we team together and say this is how we would be enforcing our fishery regulations off of Gloucester or off of Washington or off of Oregon. So we can model that behavior for them. The next one we can really help these countries out is information and intel sharing. Information is power. If you don't know folks are out there, you can't do anything about it. Maritime Domain Awareness, MDA, is a term that uh, most of us in the business use. And perfect example in July of this last summer, uh, the National Maritime Intel in Integration Center, which is a, a Navy center, uh, did some geofencing on an unclassed system. This is just saying, if you're within this box, set off an alarm. And if you engage in some of these activities, you slow to the speed, or you do circuitous routes, which probably indicate that you're actively fishing, set off an alarm. This, I'm not going to call it artificial intelligence, but it didn't require somebody to be watching the scope. This allowed us to then notify, in this partic uh, particular case, uh, it was Ghana, that folks were fishing illegally in their waters armed with this information, then they can do something about it. This is where our nation maybe can work on capacity and capability to help them have a consequence. Sally mentioned the, um, uh, the Port State Measures Agreements. If you're not familiar with those, this allows a country to say, you are not coming to my port, and you can only go to certain ports unless you give me transparency, unless you allow me to look at the fish and find out where those fish came from. If we deny those ports to those with mysterious fish that we don't know where they come from, and you can't land the fish, 
we can start closing down this industry because they have nowhere to sell it. So at this point, I think I'm going to cut my comments short, but I will say this is a team sport. Uh, the great white needle of death out there, the Coast Guard Cutter, needs a lot of help from other countries, other agencies in the United States government. We need help from the non-governmental agencies, visibility in the problem that Sally and her folks are doing, because all of us, all of us need to stand a vigilant watch on this problem. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral <coughs> and Admiral Howard. Admiral, Admiral. Admiral, Admiral. Everyone, good morning. And um, Admiral, thank you for your remarks. Sally will tell you the note I sent her yesterday was maritime security is a team sport. So there you go. Must be something about wearing blue that keeps us synchronized. So good morning, everybody. I just want to give you really right off the get-go a short history of maritime security, and then I'm going to talk to you about, um, from my personal experiences, where the Navy has been in this sphere as well as where DOD has been in this sphere and why it aligns with the reports that um, uh, Stimson Center has produced. So maritime security is is born of the nation's necessity to be able to protect itself. And for the U.S., when you go back to the Federalist Papers, uh, John Adams wrote that one piece about why we need a Navy. The first thing he said is, hey, you, if you want to maintain neutrality when other countries are at a war, you have to have the power to protect yourself. But the second thing he said is, if you want to have successful trade, you have to be able to prevent wanton meddlers, capricious tyrants, from taking control of your trade. And literally, when you think about it, his words foreshadowed the Ottoman Bay and the taking of our sailors and our trade uh, and just taking it for their own good, good for their own um, purposes. So over the years, as um, the law of the sea developed, countries soon began to have the ability to manage the resources up to 200 nautical miles out from their shores, their exclusive economic zone, and they could regulate those waters. But in addition to countries, wanton meddlers became criminals. And so you not only had to deal with the protection of your trade far from your shore, you, have to, you had to deal with um, smuggling, taking of your trade within your waters, the stealing of your resources, whether it was fishing or minerals or other assets. And then over time, what's clear is not all maritime nations have this capacity. So over the years, if you want a nation to help secure her waters, that helps underwrite that nation's security. You don't want the waters to be open in a sense that Terrorists can use it as a method to get into a country. And then you also don't want the waters to be ravished, so eventually it affects the economic condition of that country. And that can be pretty significant. Uh, as, as I, out of my last job as Naval Forces Europe and Africa, you know, the Nigerians get about 10% of their protein from the fish. And so when those waters are illegally fished and eventually exhausted, that could be a, f a food security problem for the country. My first experience looking at these issues of how do you help nations build their maritime security uh, was in a 1996, it was called the West African Training Cruise. We went there on an amphibious ship, we brought along our Coast Guard partners to do training, we brought along Marines to do training of the soldiers ashore, and we visited several nations, Senegal, Ivory Coast, Cape Verde, one of the things I took away from that trip was when we pulled into some of these countries, it had been five years since the last time a Navy ship had been in there. And we would go out and we would help these countries do training and things such as fundamental maintenance of their boats so that they could get out and about and find these wanton meddlers. Well, what we would discover is they'd had training five years before, the knowledge evaporated, the boats would break, and they would wait another few years for the U.S. Navy to come back and train them again. All of this was in my mind when years later, uh, and I was, I was an uh, officer working in 
the, merit, the strategy section of the Navy, we were reviewing the strategy. We had a, 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 our own version of the think tank, Deep Blue, and we started to rethink maritime security cooperation. And the smart folks up there said, what we really need is not a West African training cruise that goes there and State Department sort of fair shares that capability every year it's a different country. What we need is an African partnership station program where we send a ship or ships every year, but in between these visits, we supplement with mobile training teams, maritime patrol exercises, and other individual ship visits. And so that we get the continuity of relationship with these countries, but also continuity of training. So in 2007 and 8, the first African partnership deployment was born, and it went off great. And then luckily for us, that AFRICOM stands up, and they took sponsorship of this program, and it still exists today. It's become more formalized with a focus on maritime awareness, building response uh, capacity for African nations, and then building up their infrastructure. And, when, and so now they do, we do long-term planning underneath AFRICOM as Naval Forces Europe. And the last time is, was 2016, where we hosted 22 African nations at Naval Forces Europe to look at how we build shared awareness, sharing information. And then also born into this space, the nations themselves um, started to realize they have to work together. It is a team sport. So for us in the Gulf of, Gindi, tw Gulf of Guinea, 22 nations signing the Uando um, uh, Accords got the nations to be able to get to a point where the leadership, the political leadership agreed there were certain fundamentals that they needed to endorse in order for us to move forward. The biggest which of they would be able to share and report information relative to maritime crime and they didn't just go after piracy. It includes armed robbery, transnational crime, terrorism, and IUU. So out of this, Naval Forces Europe started to sponsor an annual exercise called Obagami Express. The word Obagami meaning together in, in many different African dialects. And the first exercise in the Gulf of Guinea had nine nations. And I will tell you 10 years later, Obagami Express 19, which was just held this March. There were up to 33 countries. They were getting countries as far away as Brazil to participate in training and scenarios. 95 ships, 2.5 thousand people, and 12 aircraft. And the scenarios are run. They ran 80 scenarios. The different um, nations on the Gulf of Guinea have started to build maritime ops centers, so they actually practice sharing information between the maritime ops centers as well as the national command centers. And this year, Nigeria, who hosted, stood up a maritime domain awareness training center, which will now allow um, sailors from different African nations to stay and not have to travel to Europe to get the training they need. And so it's amazing by working together how far nations can come and how much progress they can make. Has there been an effect from Obagami Express and the consistency of us being there? I would say yes. So the yeah, Admiral talked to you about some actual interventions um, for illegal fishing. We've seen interventions and we've seen piracy disrupted. We've seen uh, contra oil contra uh, contraband retaken by different nations from nations as small as Togo. And so working together we can go far. And for us, AFRICOM has been our biggest sponsor, and these exercises have now started to go on to different sections of Africa. So there's a Phoenix Express, um, and then there's a, a Cutlass Express, so that we start looking at getting the nations of East Africa and the nations along the Mediterranean to work together in a similar manner. So for me, this whole area, this sphere of maritime security, and then this overlap with transnational crime to include illegal fishing has shown me that the only way nations can get to maritime security is working internally with their partners, but also working externally with other nations. Thank you. Thank you very much.
very much, Admiral. Um, now we're going to move to um, Tony Long, who is over in the UK. Um, I love this team sport analogy, uh, particularly after the big Nats win this week. But now we're going across the pond. So. Are you a Red Sox fan? What happened? Oh, don't. Uh. <laughs> okay. Um, there's Tony we, in the little teeny box. But um, Tony can see us. But um, he's going to show some slides, and then hopefully we'll see him in, on the big screen. Go ahead, Tony. Last break. You should expect me to say that it's been a dog there. I've been in the academy for the last about 10 years, two years. Uh, one of all our experience so far is uh, the Avalon was in a net run position. Uh, he was really uh, able to play that and he was quite long in the game. Uh, uh, the other is the Durant and the Paul Warren team this year. A lot of the things I found in the net position is that there's people that will come up and not allow you to get a chance to get the ball. And 
Tony. We're trying to do that. It is not changing. <laughs> Jack's working on it. Well, it doesn't seem to be working, Tony. So, um, okay. tell us, well, describe to us what we're supposed to be seeing. <laughs> Tell me what we have up is the global footprint of transshipment. Excellent. Okay, so you can see there that it's pervasive. And what I wanted to just mention here is we're working very closely with a few charitable trusts to
now you're on the last screen. So there, there is a, a country that has gone transparent, which is partly to change the way people perceive how we're generally a government and state. Uh, what I'd like to do is work with countries and agencies in order to drive transparency. I'd like to see 20 countries where 20 countries share their information, much in the same way we've seen four state measures proliferate in the space of just a few years. The transparency side supports four state measures. It's cheap, cost effective, rewards the compliant vessels, and can only make the bad vessels stand out. So, with that, I should hand back to you and uh, you to take questions. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Tony, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we did get all your slides up eventually, so I apologize for the, the delay. Um, so we have about 20 minutes left. I'm going to ask you all a few questions, and then really I, I, I think we should turn it over to the audience. Um, you know, Admiral um, Abel, <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> Admiral Admiral. Um, Admiral Abel, um, you know, the Coast Guard has been known, and particularly when you were in Southcom, of really working at, you know, um, trying to introduct dr interdu interdict drugs and drug traffickers. Um, but it seems like there has been a shift to incorporate more IE, combating IUU fishing into the mission. Um, why has that changed, and how has it changed with regard to just the, the general operations of, of, of uh, your community out there? Make sure I got this as well. I mean, uh, I would not say we backed off on counter narcotics. Right. Certainly, uh, I, I would say that we have probably gotten a little more precision in the counter-narcotics business. Uh, what we find is, uh, and the fire triangle that it takes, um, candidly, is almost the same that it would take for finding anything at the sea. Uh, number one is you need intelligence. Now, intelligence in the counter-fisheries thing may be, what's the salinity, what's the water temperature, where are the fish likely to be, mm -hmm. overhead imagery, the things that Tony's talking about, that may put you in the right zip code if you have a ship out there. The second thing you need is, on scene presence, um, and so uh, you need the ship uh, that's uh, that's going to be able to action it. And then the last part is, of course, then the the actual end game, uh, which is what you do with them. So it's the same model you could use for fisheries as well. Um, and we're finding through unmanned aerial systems and some other ways uh, that we're getting pretty efficient in finding the druggers. Not that we have a lot of extra coast guard to go around. It, interesting factoid: um, 36 states in the Union have a bigger budget than the United States Coast Guard. Hmm. Okay. We have a budget about the size of the state of New Hampshire. And New Hampshire is not buying a lot of warships, C-130s, H-60s, or icebreakers. So to say there's more Coast Guard to go around, uh, we're a tiny, tiny little service to try to optimize what we can do. And the same model that we've done with the drug war, like with Costa Rica, if we can get the State Department to help us buy them boats, teach them, Get them, and then at that point, uh, maybe our job is information sharing or Tony arms them with the information. We can back off, and we can be extremely proud of how these nations are taking care of their sovereignty, their water, and the fish that really don't care where the sovereignty is because they'll swim all the way back to Alaska when it's time to spawn. So, I mean, that's, that's how you really get after it is this shouldn't be a U.S. problem. We equip these nations with capacity and capability and information. Wow. Well. And that's going to lead me right into my next question to Admiral Howard. But just know that, um, you know, looking around this room, there are a lot of people here who want to make sure that your budget is not the size <laughs> of New Hampshire's, and yeah. uh, maybe it goes to its neighboring Massachusetts <laughs> yeah, or go. New York. Yeah, um, so um, let's all think about that. Um, so Admiral Howard, um, you know, sort of following on the on the same sort of vein, you know, uh, the U.S. Navy is not. A small coastal state budget, um, obviously, but you know it has a lot of missions. And um, you know why do they care about IUU fishing? And what is the actual role in the Navy, maybe even versus the Coast Guard or just the U.S. Navy in general? So we're a large enough country that there's a clear division of law enforcement, a sea service that regulates the U.S. waters and uh, a service that's there for defense to protect trade overseas, protect American interest, and uh, uh, protect our security interest. And so we're going to be the one who's overseas when an American gets kidnapped. Um, we're going to be the one, um, if there's threats to, to U.S. 
cargo at sea, then we're going to be the ones who are already deployed, ready to protect those interests. The piece where we share is um, you start off by saying this is a complex environment, and it is. The Watton meddlers wear many hats. And so if you're good at smuggling, you might be smuggling cigarettes because that's the best monetary uh, um, business you can be in. But if you're good at smuggling and then somebody comes to you, you might be smuggling terrorists. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes more of an interest to the U.S. Navy. Or you might be moving refugees um, because that's a, a high profitable market at the moment. And so you have this, as Tony pointed out, this sort of overlap of behavior. And so when you're out there and you're going after a wanton meddler, you don't know who necessarily you're going to catch and that they could, they could be involved in all different types, of, um, trans, different types of transnational crime or underpinning terrorism. And so the oceans and seas are big, so you need to have relationships with Coast Guards and with other navies in order to just get an understanding of the environment, but in reality to be able to have, create enough capacity to um, make an impact in the environment, to actually catch these people. Um, and so as far as I'm concerned, if I'm out there and it's a, it's a, it's a Coast Guard detachment and we're doing good, in any area of maritime security, we're improving maritime security for not just the U.S., but for the world at that point. And if I could just key on, I mean, yes, you know, please do. Uh, the Admiral mentioned it's not an either or. Right. If, if you take five Coasties on the back of a Navy ship, uh, when it comes time to do something law enforcement related, uh, the Navy ship is proud to hoist a Coast Guard pennant, and Coast Guard boots going on a vessel is a whole different legal geopolitical message than a Navy boot going on a vessel. And uh, so making use of a DDG that may be out there and the five coasties that carry all their authorities with them is a huge multiplier for us. And we're doing that in the Pacific and we're doing that at that AMLEP. We also do it off the Navy ships as well. Wow, that's a really good point. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the shiprider agreements and, 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 the, and, the, and the cooperation. And you know, I, before I ask Tony a question, I just want to note, you know, the, um, the Maritime Safe Act, which is um, about to pass as part of the National Defense Authorization Act, really focuses on the, you know, the one, um, one governance uh, effort mm -hmm. and, um, you know, tries to break down the stovepipes, which it sounds like don't need to be so broken down. But anyway, uh, I'm, I think it's going to give you all a lot of, you know, mm -hmm authority for what you're already doing right. so so that's great um, Tony I, I do have a question for you um, you know you talked about all of these nations that are starting to sign up for the for transparency Panama Costa Rica Chile um, um, and Indonesia I mean what's motivating them and how are you getting them to do that I think people are realizing that <clears throat> traditional enforcement uh, globally is, isn't working it's, it's still an important key factor because some of the worst actors are never going to change and, and that's where the, the action is needed but for some of these countries they can't afford a coast guard uh, that can act in the way they can't afford the drones the, the personnel required just to sit in, a, in, in some kind of operations center the training and the maintenance it, it's tough so the, the idea is that by moving towards transparency shifting the burden, you're shifting the burden away from the authorities trying to prove bad, prove bad behavior and, uh, and allow fishermen to prove their good behavior, i.e. reward that compliance. Um, it's, a, it's a better model. And, and also we see a shift in behavior because they're, they're being watched, so you should have less bad vessels to go after, <laughs> which again is an economic benefit both to the nation that's doing the watching, but also the patrol vessels that are spending less time at sea to more effect, or more time at sea to better effect, depends on how you want to spend your money. So that, that's the key. Now, the, the important thing here is, it's all well and good having technology, but you have to have the policy to back it up, and it has to be implemented. So at the moment, if the, you can have a nation that stands very strong against illegal fishing, and what we'll see actually is a lot of them move north and south to other countries that are being less vigilant. 
So it's actually a net loss potentially to a country uh, to push her home. So this cooperation has got to be seen as an economic cooperation that if two or three or four countries can do this at the same time, you push the illegal fishers so far, they can't afford to go around the ports. They've just got to change their behavior. So what we want to see really is people coming together. If you look at South America now, Chile, Peru, Ecuador are discussing with us, Colombia is interested, Panama has done it, Costa Rica are there, Mexico actually has shared data uh, under their transparency laws, um, and then we're coming down the east coast of South America with Brazil looking at different methods as well. Suddenly you've got an Atlantic wall that changes <laughs> the way fishers have to behave if they want to circumvent it. I think that's why people want to embrace transparency. Great. Thank you so much, Tony. And, and you know, I think it was here we coined a phrase a few years ago about the community of action that was needed for IEU fishing, um, and that was in, in amongst ourselves, and now it's really uh, clearly through your work and the work of everyone here moving to a global community of action. So let's open it up to questions if we could. Um, let's start, yes, right here with Chuck. And if you all could just say who you are and, and, and who you represent, that would be helpful. My name is Chuck Fox. I'm with a group called Oceans 5, and this would be to the two admirals, I, I guess. Um, I had the privilege of serving as a uh, law enforcement officer of maritime here in Chesapeake Bay. I had uh, 200 law enforcement officers and several dozen boats, and I don't think I still provided anywhere near effective deterrence. Um, and this world of transparency, to me, is the way of the future, where we get more and more people involved in deterrence. My question to you really is the United States has an ability to expand its transparency under existing law. Um, we have, you know, by regulation, you could mandate more AIS, you could condition imports based on AIS. I'd just be curious to get your sense as to what is the political dynamic in this country that prevents us from getting more transparency? Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, I, I can't imagine there's any hindrance to that. Um, you know, I, I would say um, the so what and the what next. Obviously, once you find out you've got more information, you have to action that. Uh, but uh, at, at that point, um, certainly knowing what's in the maritime, and, and as you know, it's a dance. I mean, uh, for generations, uh, free trade and what, you know, offshore and safe passage and all that stuff, the more you leverage regulations on other countries, then they levy. Uh, more burdensome stuff on us, and we certainly don't want to hurt the $5.6 trillion worth of maritime trade that comes in and out of the ports. I mean, already, uh, you know, we mandate above a certain size. you got to tell the United States 96 hours out you're coming, what's on board your vessel, who's in the crew. We do a vetting. If you don't come from a port that's already been inspected by the U.S. Coast Guard and deemed safe, you're probably going to anchor out, and you're going to have to have an at-sea and boarding, which slows them down, and they hate that because time is money. So I would say economically and, and through transparency, we're already doing a lot of things to make sure that even if you come close to our shores, uh, we know what's out there. Um, domest now, domestic fisheries, uh, there's a whole different challenge there, I would say. Um, you know, you're talking international IUU. I wish I could tell you everybody off of Gloucester is squeaky clean. Um, there are some folks that do a phenomenal job, and they fish what's out there, and they support their families, and, and we certainly stand by them. But there are folks that uh, maybe aren't as diligent as they should. So there's a whole different domestic fleet that we can talk about as well, but this is certainly the international side. We want to make sure that the international fishermen don't um, take away the fish. Like I mentioned, the, the, you know, the, the folks of the Alaskan fisheries, uh, the fact those are migratory species that for five years they're not in our U.S. waters and suddenly they're back in our U.S. waters. So, Evelyn, do you want to talk about uh, transparency? Or? So um, my experience has been um, post 9-11 a lot of barriers fell down but that really mostly affected military to military and then in intelligence sharing and so um, after 9-11 even the, the uh, out of looking east when I was the deputy commander of Fleet Forces Command our our watch floor is integrated so Coast Guard's in there mm -hmm. and more importantly to us for that Northern Passage Canada is in and we share with them what I found, though, is I got more senior. There's now more barriers, though, between information sharing when you're trying to cross the intelligence to law enforcement, right? So trying to bring in law enforcement, there are a lot of protections for the good of the U.S. individual, but it makes it hard to share information that way. And so I don't think it's, a, it's not the 
were against transparency, it's um, the government has created rightfully some division to make sure that we're not getting into areas where we're violating people's individuals, if not companies' rights. And so that, that last barrier mm -hmm. and how you could wicker that and get that more speed, it, it can happen, it just is a process. And if you could get to, okay, for, for the goodness of the country, can we get to that more quickly? I think that's the last barrier. Well, and I'm, I'm fascinated that Tony's getting folks to share VMS. I mean, yes. there is nothing more private than where a fisherman finds the fish. And I know domestically, we would try to share VMS tracks, and I can tell you the fishing companies are like, no, you're not. Because that's how we're making money, because we know where the fish are and our competitors don't. So, I mean, there is a little bit of an economic thing going on there of transparency is good, but you're kind of giving away your trade secrets. So if I could just add a little bit to that, I mean, I think, you know, clearly under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, we have some of the toughest fisheries management uh, uh, in, here in the U.S. And the, in the overall, in the whole world. But I'd also push back a little bit that with technology, though the days of we know where our fish are and nobody else knows where our fish are, are starting to wane. And um, I think as other countries, like those on Tony's list and others start to really step up and share, tr be more transparent and share this information. We don't want the U.S. to be at a disadvantage of accessing markets if that becomes a precursor for um, market access. And so I think it's something we all need to, to think about um, as we move forward. Um, but, but I also say yep. technology can be, you know, in the case I mentioned, the, uh, the geofencing, um, that particular company was spoofing the MMSI, which is a unique mm. number. Mm. They had five vessels claiming to be one vessel. Mm. So just like everything in cyber, mm. you think you got it, mm. and then suddenly you realize, oh, somebody just really got smart with a keyboard, and suddenly it's not as good. I, I don't know if Tony wants to talk about the, the veracity of the data. Yeah, Tony, before we head on to one more question, do you want to just very quickly touch on that? Yeah. Just very briefly, so, so the companies that sell the AIS are very much aware of the um, vulnerabilities of the, of the system. Remember, this was this was created to stop vessels colliding with the sea. Other. So small vessels that are hidden by waves and heavy seas or heavy weather uh, are seen still by big vessels. It just so happens that when they connected it to the satellite network, all of a sudden there was a global picture of vessels out there, including merchant vessels, that we can take advantage of. But the AIS companies still want to sell this, so there, there's a lot of work going on to uh, recognize when, when something's turned off or disconnected. So the last thing that happens uh, as you turn it off, there's a signal goes, this has just been turned off. So you know it's been turned off. It's not just been locked. Um, also, if they're gonna manipulate the data such that they try and transpose their position, there's a Doppler shift change, and you just do a bit of math, and there's a lot of onboard satellites now that can work out that that Doppler shift is not the way it should be, and therefore you can recognize spoofs. So um, it's, it's getting better all the time. I think okay. the key thing is is that, that you don't just rely on one source. You, you, you need more than one source of data, ideally. Um, and, and that's really the key, is, is having more, one, more, more than one source. All right, great. Thank you, Tony. We have a lot of hands up in the room, so um, why don't we start here? Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Julie Stallhut. I'm at the State Department. And I noticed one thing that jumped out at me uh, is that both on the list of... Am I not loud enough? Okay. <laughs> is that both... Thanks. Both on the list of, um, of countries involved in, you know, being in... IUU fishing and countries that are sort of victimized by IUU fishing. There's Vanuatu, which maybe has a quarter of a million people. And I'm wondering if that's uh, sort of an artifact of some of the difficulties over defining uh, exclusive economic zones in the Pacific Islands. Uh, is there, a, it just really the fact that it was right behind the U.S. as being <laughs> Well, um, Vanuatu um, is used as for access and um, flags and, uh, you know, Chuck, you've been there many, many times. I don't know if you want to comment on that. There's a flag of convenience. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yes. In the back. 
Alex Sanchez, Jens Defense Weekly. Back in March 2016, the Argentine Coast Guard Perfecto Derbez shot at and sank a Chinese fishing vessel, the Lu Yan Yuan Yu No. 10, that was allegedly fishing uh, with authorization in Argentine waters and allegedly tried to ram the, Ar the Argentine fishing uh, Coast Guard vessel to avoid being captured. I was wondering if you can, if you, what is your opinion about this incident? Will this become the norm? Will we see more incidents like this? And will we see distant water fleets arming themselves to protect themselves from security forces to avoid being captured? Thank you. Well, I, I hope it doesn't become the norm. Um, you know, I, I hope that through the uh, port state measures and some other things that uh, if you catch the fish, you can't take it anywhere anyway. Um, but certainly that type of aggressive action, you certainly would hope does not become the norm. Um, but and, uh, but no, I, I, I think it was aggressive, and uh, it certainly sends a message, though, that's for sure. Um, Admiral yeah. Howard, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, so I, I have, you know, when you look back, particularly over the history of piracy, it's, it's become um, um, more and more armed, and so it's, you know, the, the bad news is if an incident like that um, gets a lot of visibility, that gives other criminals ideas. <laughs> Why didn't we think of that? Mm -hmm. You know, we'll just uh, arm ourselves and then we'll evade capture. So generally criminals will uh, go down a path and then if something proves to be successful then it starts to franchise pretty quickly has been my experience. But the question on flags of convenience, I would, if there was a, a space where I think in terms of law of the sea where defense and state could work together. You know, t Tony is doing fantastic work. So this first step is getting flags of convenience to say, yes, my data is available to you. But you think about it had to be international law in order for us to be able to do what we did for counter piracy. It was a UN resolution where the transnational government of Somalia said, we now open up our territorial waters to all nations of the world. And the UN said, we encourage nations of the world to act on behalf of Somalia to fight pirates and to, they don't have a Coast Guard, they don't have a Navy, you can take care of, and so now you're legally covered. Well, if in the case of flags of convenience, which is really done for revenue, but these smaller countries don't really have a case to regulate, wouldn't it be great to have a UN resolution where the nations, navies, and coast guards of the world could act on behalf of that flag and help regulate. And so then you don't have to have a stateless flag situation aboard. But if flags, countries that don't have capacity but would be willing to encourage, or encourage other nations, we'll give you the authority to board this ship if you think illegal fishing is happening. That to me, then you're starting to help create the the uh, legal playing field where all of this becomes easier. Well, 95% you know, of fishery is covered by some regional fisheries management organization. Mm -hmm. Like I said, of the 16 that are out there, only three allow actual boardings. So right there, I mean, that is kind of under the UN, and the UN sanctions it and says, you guys manage your fish, but if you can't get on board, it's an honor system. And I think we're seeing where the honor system's taking us. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and just one le le note about the Argentinian uh, situation. I mean, the good news, I mean, it was a bad news situation, but the good news is it did get so much press um, and that I think that public awareness of that incident really did put uh, a fair amount of pressure on uh, the Chinese government. And, and, and I think just having that continued pressure and awareness globally is, is really key for all of us uh, to keep, uh, keep on. So I think we have time for two more questions. And um, so I'm gonna, I've got a gentleman over here that's practically jumping up and down. So please. Uh. Thank you very much uh, for setting the stage for this conversation. I'm David Hartshorn. I work with Geeks Without Frontiers. Uh, we are operating downstream, if you will, uh, in the fleets of Southeast Asia on forced labor prevention. And uh, we're siloed in, in, the, in trying to combat forced labor and human trafficking. And very quickly, we found that IU, we learned the acronym IUU right. 
and schooled up on it somewhat. And what we found, I want, this really goes to the comment that Tony made about, I mean, we've seen four different silos, all of which relate to each other, but which are all be, being treated separately to the detriment of getting toward a solution that is holistic, refugees, mm -hmm. piracy, mm -hmm. IUU, forced labor, you know, and I'm semi-educated. Okay, we're just getting spun up on this. But Tony, I'm, I'm just wondering, and anyone uh, who feels compelled to answer this, upstream from the fray, is there a point at which big picture, all of these challenges which relate to each other can be or are being addressed. Tony, do you want to start with that? And then I'll ask you if anyone here on the on podium has a, I mean, on the stage has a, a comment. So we know, we know that all of these things are being addressed, but in that sense of uh, one focal point, I, I, I don't think so. The, you've opened up the, the debate saying it's a complex global problem. <laughs> I think what we've got to accept here is that it is exactly that. And what we need to be is aware of what each other are doing in order that you can understand what progress is being made in different areas and try and always drive that Venn diagram of overlapping data. So we know, for instance, where there's uh, forced labor uh, are linked to uh, four flags. There's certain states, the ILO reports have been reported for many years uh, documenting people jumping overboard or setting fire to the vessel in the hope the Coast Guard will come and rescue them. It's well documented. So what we've got to do is get better at trying and join these things together. One of the big steps forward is the signing of the Cape Town Agreement last week in Tom Molinos. 47 states have acceded to that. And once that's ratified and opened and changed, safe seas is the hashtag. You know, the fact is there's going to be a change in the way people have to look after uh, people on fishing vessels because it's all about safety of life and sea. You can use big data. There are algorithms that are being proven to work to indicate when a vessel is spending too long at sea or acting in unusual ways, which indicates they're paying their people less or not giving them shore leave or treating them badly. And that can give some indicators. And again, this is about risk management and trying to get people who can do something about it to channel their resources in the right places, whether it be boardings at sea or port inspections. And when port state measures first came out, it was all about the fish. But people have started <laughs> to realize that actually if someone boards a vessel for an inspection because they're not behaving uh, as they should for uh, as a fishing vessel, all of a sudden you get to see how many folks are there? Have they got fire safety? You can do a dozen different things once you're on board a ship to point out that there's something you need to be doing. You can spot these things, and that information has to get to the right authorities. Thank you, Tony. And, and I'll just say, as I look around the room, you know, I see um, a combination of both folks who've been working on the IUU issue as well as some of the labor rights issues. And so I think as a community ourselves, we've all star already started to integrate more on how to address this, and, and I think that's really important that we do far more of that moving forward. Um, let's take one more question. Um, Oh, gosh. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, right here in the middle. Um. Hi. Um, good morning. Angela Kirkman for um, Wild Aid. Um, I wanted to thank you first for a great report. Um, I really recognize the work that Stimson does in this area and great that it's um, receiving the funding to do this work and a really great discussion. Um, you started off, Sally, by saying, you know, this is the first step in a process. And I see there's some robust recommendations out of this. So would you mind just sort of summarizing what you see as the next steps and anybody else jump into, you know, tangible things that we can do as a community all together? As you say, there's a good uh, cross-section of people in the audience. And uh, I guess we all recognize how important it is. So, you know, what are the kinds of things that can be done at the various levels? Sure. I'll just touch on briefly. I mean, I think it's so important to really focus on the marketplace um, as a precursor to have access to try to set up some of these things. I mean, you know, what we found is economics are really the issue. Um, and so to the extent that we can make the um, economic case to these countries that aren't being transparent or these businesses that aren't being transparent, that that's the, that's the ability to gain uh, access into the marketplace. That's really key. You know, whether it's EAIS, VMS, traceability, um, you know, openness about ownership, et cetera. 
Um, let me see if others have any, any thoughts about um, some of the other recommendations. Uh, I mean, you, you pegged it right. I mean, why do people do this? Because it makes some money. So we have to figure out where in the supply chain we can introduce enough either uncertainty or cost that it's not profitable anymore. So. So getting back to the team sport piece and then your recognition of the silos, thank you for reminding of us. I think we have an opportunity within the Gulf of Guinea. So you, the nations themselves recognize these silos. So when you look at the Yuanda Code of Conduct, they talk about we have to work together to counter all of these areas. What they lack is capacity. And one of the purposes is for safeguarding fishermen and seafarers. So they understand that dimension as well. But where other where everybody could get together is if we can help them bring the Yuandi Code of Conduct to its magnificent perfection, then you've got a model of an agreement between nations that you could start exporting around the world. And I think one of the pieces that's missing in that Code of Conduct, because it's an agreement between nations, is how you bring in other outside forces who want to help. I, I bet the countries who signed that conduct would love to have geeks without, geeks without frontiers <laughs> in their mocks, helping them un correlate that data and understanding that data, and helping them share and un you know, the richness of that data. And so there's, there's probably more there that could be done from State Department defense, helping elevate the code of conduct making it completely successful so that there's no more illegal trafficking, no more piracy, no more terrorism issues in that Gulf, and that you've helped create a stable area. Thank you. Well, being mindful that I know Admiral One, Admiral, Admiral, um, has a, another engagement that he has to get to, I think we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, I want to thank you all and just sort of end where I, where I really began, which is, Again, looking around the room, we have many um, uh, agencies represented. We have, you know, Hill. We have NGOs. We have, you know, just a, a real integrated group of people working on this. And I think that's what it's going to take domestically, globally, for all of us to really grapple with these issues that are really about economic security, food security, and environmental security. So with that, let's thank our great panelists. You guys are awesome. Well done. And thank you, Tony. Have a good weekend, everybody. There we go. Thanks.